Hi, uh, welcome back to uh, Welsh State's Coaching Insights with uh, myself, Ryan Jones, Lean on Throws. Uh, and tonight's guest, and an important guest, is Sean Pickering. Sean, a, a medalist in the Kuala Lumpur Games in the shot put and, and went to Atlanta in the Olympics and, and interestingly took over sort of two of the heavy throws in terms of his early days in Hammer and then moving to the shot put late in his career after a short break to his, you know, sort of his role in the UK of, of coach development and basically just having that link to some of the best coaches in, in, in the throws world. I'll pass you over to Sean who will introduce himself. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, this is a coaching talk, and so my interest really in coaching developed out of my uh, interest as an athlete. Um, as you said, I was a an athlete quite early on, and and got lucky enough to go to the university in America, and then um, got into work. And I had eight years where I was running around the world. I ran the sponsorship for Canon, uh, which was very interesting, but it didn't allow a lot of time to train, so I was away uh, 250 days a year. So then I decided I wanted to get back into being an athlete and try and make the Olympics. So I started training in 95 and, and made the Olympics in 96. And I continued training through to Kuala Lumpur because I had three goals. One was to make the Olympics. One was to throw 20 meters. Another one was to do well in a major championship. So when I won a medal at Kuala Lumpur, um, that, was, uh, that was enough for me and I could walk away. But I put my attention more then to coaching and, and, and more than anything else, I, I don't really count myself straightforward as a coach because I think I'm much more of a facilitator. The, the most important thing about me is my contact list. And so I spend a lot of time speaking to a lot of really good coaches um, and athletes around the world. And so what I try to do is to support coaches where I can and, and to work with coaches. As you said, I was brought in um, by Charles and uh, in in the lead up to London 2012, where um, he asked me to come and join UK Athletics because the, the idea was to try and get people qualified for the Olympics. Because I think we had, I think we had one in 2008. That was Goldie. I'm not sure if he had any, any other throwers. So with a home Olympics, it was important to try and get people qualified. And so the idea was not to bring me into coach, but to bring me in to try and lift up the level of the athletes and the coaches that were working with the top level athletes and try and get people across that line and, and qualified for the Olympics. And I'm pleased to say we got people qualified in, in every throws event. Um, we had a couple that didn't get selected for one reason or another, but we, we had people qualified. And, and that year in 2012, one of the great things was we had uh, five athletes over 63 meters in the discus. Yeah. Um, and we were leading uh, nation in the world that, that year. Um, with that and so you know Brett Morse and and uh, and uh, was one of the beneficiaries of, of that and and uh, Lawrence Okoye pretty special talent so it was quite a great uh, time to be involved in the sport and and that was kind of my role again and that's where I, I continue in, to be involved in the coaching side of things I'm particularly interested in the performance side and trying to do a few things to, to yeah. make sure that we get the top end up as well as the development levels come through. Yeah, definitely. And, and also, I remember coming to the to the clinics with, with obviously my previous coaches, you know, up in, up in Loughborough and, and seeing that explosion of discus where you had not just Lawrence and Abdul and, and Brett, but you had Chris Scott and, and various others coming behind them. In terms of this lockdown, Sean, and we had a, a brief a brief talk before this in terms of some of the good goodness that has come out of this uh, lockdown is, is your sort of online coach education with the Portuguese Federation. Is that something that you will uh, take forward with, with the lockdown or? Sure. It, it's not just with the Portuguese Federation. There was something oh, that came sorry. out of it. But, but the general idea is we know that in the future, coach education must go online. It's what I've been talking with the IAAF, now World Athletics, about this, about European athletics. I'm involved. I'm, I'm one of the members of the European Athletics Coaches Association, uh, along with Frank Dick, who's the president. And we know that there has to be a shift. Uh, I've been delivering stuff for the IAAF on their coach education platform and working with other coaches like Don Babbitt around the world that do that. And we know that uh, to go forwards, we have to go much more towards online or e-coaching and finding that balance between where you learn the science of coaching, and where you learn the art of coaching, which really needs to come from being around good coaches. And so one of the things that I think has come out of the, or one of the few good things that has come out of this lockdown period is that because people have been forced into coaching online and communicating online, um, we've now become much more accustomed and, and more accepting of online uh, as a, a means of delivering education. And so 
from that, my interest right at the beginning uh, came from how can we make this platform work best for coaches? And so a couple of things came out of it. One was we were intending to go to a, a, a camp ahead of the European winter throws, which was going to be in Leria, Portugal. And, and as part of that camp and the lead up around the European winter throws where every European country is present, uh, Paolo Reis, the, the Polish, the Portuguese national coach, wanted to do some coach education. And so uh, with my friends, uh, Vestine Hafsteinsen and a couple of others, we were going to do some coach education live down there in, in uh, Leria. And then when everything got forced into lockdown, we were still hoping the camp was going to go ahead. When that became clear, it wasn't. Paolo said, well, I still like to do something. Uh, what do you think we can do? And we discussed an idea to try and do some online coach education for his coaches. And it started off with just the Portuguese coaches. And he asked me to kick it off with a presentation. Um, and I did the first one. And, and then it, it grew over the course. We actually did it for five weeks. We finished the last one on Friday. We had uh, one presentation a day, basically two hours. And we had some of the best coaches in the world that came and delivered on that platform. So Mac Wilkins from the USA got up at 6.30 in the morning also to take part in these presentations. Um, you know, we had uh, uh, Klaus Bartonit, who's the greatest biomechanics on, on throws in the world. He's now in India. And he was there sitting alongside Uwe Hohn um, in lockdown in India, but talking to these coaches. And we had ended up with coaches from Great Britain, from uh, Spain, from America, uh, from Greece, from all over the world that followed this platform. And for me, that was really interesting to figure out how it worked and how we could use it effectively in terms of presentations and yeah. what worked, what didn't work. And the other thing that came out of it was that Tora Gustafsson, who Tora is our coach that worked with Nick Miller and Sophie, McK uh, Sophie Hitchin, um, he's based in California. Luckily, they're still able to train, but we've always been talking about coach education from a performance level. Um, you, you mentioned some of the things we did in the lead up to 2012, where you came to be a part of some of the best coaches in the world coming in. Well, we haven't really tapped into Tor's knowledge as a, yeah. as a coach. So we've been running a weekly uh, session for some of the top uh, hammer coaches and athletes in Great Britain um, that started off just, we just do Thursday with Tor and, and basically it's just, he would present for 20 minutes and then we'd have 20 minutes of question and answers. So that small drip feed uh, and to do that on a weekly basis, that's, that's come across very, very well. So it's been really interesting to see what works out of this and what we can go forward with. Like, I, I like what you're saying with the, the you know the 20 minutes and 20 minutes because that that's that's just enough information for people to digest I guess and take away, um, you know and, and I've been part of some of those online sort of tutorials if you want to call them but I feel that going online kind of breaks down some barriers as well just because you know you can have tour over in, in in California and you can have yourself here you can have you know me or other people in Wales England India everywhere and you kind of find that that time and and it, yeah. and it gives i feel like it gives a better option um for young coaches and you know we're looking at new coaches coming through you know, new and old you can access that information from wherever you are rather yeah. than in the past getting in the car and traveling three four five six hours round trip and so, i think that's where for me that's what's been really interesting to figure out how does it work effectively for people because that's what I'm, I'm a communicator i try yeah. to see that as my role a facilitator in these things so very often uh, I was acting as the moderator because if somebody's presenting, there's two things about it. One, it's if, if people are presenting and they talk for an hour and a half without a break in between and people are trying to get questions in, that doesn't be, a, it's not necessarily a very good uh, presentation either. Um, so you need people to be clear about what they're doing, but also to have a moderator that can break in and, and say, hey, by the way, there's a question to come in and be aware of what's going on. And that's where the, the session with Tor has been very good because he would present for 20 minutes. I'd shut off everyone's microphones and then they would start messaging me in the chat box. And then I could introduce at the right time to answer those questions. And I think being effective in those, uh, those formats, it, then you can see what it can do and, and where I think we can use it very well in the future. Yeah, definitely. And I think it, it kind of highlights then on, on what you've said before and, and what, Many people won't know is, is your dad also been national coach coach for Wales in the past and you know the Ron Pickering fund and and so forth and he was obviously a, a commentator and rollers coach. Do you feel that um, you've learned a lot from him in his commentating? I know you've said in the past you have. 
Yeah, but, you know, the thing about my dad is my dad is known as a communicator. And even in his role, he was a national coach for Wales um, in the 60s, uh, 1961. He, he moved down to Wales and, and uh, before I was born. So I was born in Wales. Um, but his role as a national coach for Wales was not to coach athletes. It was to coach coaches and teachers. He was actually employed, I think, 80% of his salary came from the, um, from the education department. And so he traveled around Wales coaching coaches and teachers. And that ability to get out there and communicate was very, very important. And uh, on his own time, he coached a, a group of athletes, including Lynn Davis and some very successful throwers and things. But that was done very much in his own time. Yeah. But the role of communicating, and he wrote a couple of books that are still very current and, and quite interesting, but it's being able to put across information in a succinct form was what I really picked up from my father. Yeah. And, and, and that was why he became a commentator. It was because Lynn was breaking records every week and people didn't know what questions to ask after a while. Yeah. So they started asking my father to ask the questions and then they finally said, well, you might as well come in and, and you know, talk about it. And so I, I, I enjoy talking about events. I enjoy following up on some of those things as well. And, and so the ability to get information across well is very important to me yeah. of yeah. these formats and, and other ways. Yeah. Now, I think uh, also from one of the discussions that Bernd Gobert discussed on, you know, how to coach and how, how to get it across. And I feel, you know, you know, I'm a big believer in, you know, if we can educate the coach, the coach can have sort of 10, 20, 30, hundreds of athletes come, come through over the, the years. And I think that's a very big important. That's what sort of this series is, is really all about, just to give the young coach a, an option to go up and sort of, knock on the door of the best coaches and you know even if it's in Cardiff or even if it's in Wales or, or further afield ideally that I find that especially within the throws coaches are very open maybe not so much in, in, by the way, in this country but across the world I find that coaches are very open to discuss yeah. and because essentially there's no secrets is there you know people have been thrown a, a long way you know it's where you come into biomechanics and understanding you know, the science behind the sport but nothing has really changed what we're doing in the ring to for years no it's that's what's interesting though that's what really drives me on I, I i like talking to some of the legends of the sport be it coaches or athletes finding out what they did how do we can bring that into the modern day but as you said most of those guys particularly the good guys are incredibly generous with their time and their their opinion we had dale stevenson on uh, this portuguese coach uh, uh program the other day the coach of, of uh, tom walsh um you know just totally open about what are they doing how they do it any questions you know there's no airs and graces and i think that's where also we have this chance to break down barriers my goal you know for someone like yourself as a developing coach i've always tried to bring you into these conversations and bring you into these opportunities because i think one of the things is you know we, we've got used to this idea of a of a talent id program for athletes but we also need to have a talent id program for coaches and when you were an athlete, I already said to you, I think you're going to make a great coach. And I always wanted you to be a part of all those things we were doing to immerse yourself in those great coaches around the world so that you can learn. And we see now with what you've done with, with Alid and the other athletes, you know, that you've picked up on that. And that's, that's what's important also about going forwards, sharing information, sharing knowledge, being open. And, and there is a, you know, there is the science of coaching. There's the things you can learn from a book. But there are certain things on the art of coaching which really only come when you're around a really good coach and watch them operate. And, and that's one of the things. My father, back in the day, he used to run the, what used to be the Loughborough Summer Schools. And they were incredible sources of information where people would come from all over the world just to watch top coaches work with top athletes and learn from that. And so when we were doing this thing with Tor the other day, uh, some of what we do is we just watch him coach Nick or Sophie and look at it from his perspective. He'll be holding the camera, but we can listen to what he's saying to the athletes so we understand also the communication. He's explained the technical part about what he's trying to do. Now we see him put it into practice and the language of coaching, which is also an incredibly important part of how to, to get good results from, from, from athletes. Yeah, and I think it's, um, you know what I mean, say in terms of like me going to speak to those coaches or when introduced to someone, you know, whether it be Matt Wilkins or Bestin or, you know, Tor, it's, at some point in, in their coaching career, they were at that stage or they were at that very much development stage in terms of making mistakes and seeing their sort of coaching idols in front of them. And yeah. 
that, that's what I'm trying to get across is that it doesn't matter where you're starting from. Everyone's been to that point. There's, there's very few that have had been landed with, you know, the, the, the knowledge that someone like Art Menegas has right now. He didn't have that 40, 50 years ago. He, he's picked it up along the way. And I think that's important why we need to use these, you know, these online, you know. There's a, case, there's a case in point here. One of the athletes that I work with at the moment, um, I work with a group of heptathletes, one of whom is Neve Everson. And uh, she's the best talent in the world. Uh, we've seen her in the last year really come through and, and make a, a great in, impact. Um, and her coach, David Feeney, is a young coach that was a decathlete at Loughborough. And I helped him a little bit in the past. So he came to me a few years ago and said, look, you know, I, I, I liked what you did with me in the shot put. I've now got this girl coming through. She was about probably 16, 15, 16 at the time. And yeah. said, you know, can you teach me a little bit and, and, and get to, you know, help me to, to teach her to throw. And, and then that developed me supporting him and the, and, and, uh, and the other girls, there's nine girls in the group. Um, but the other thing about that is that um, part of my role, and you mentioned the Ron Picker Memorial Fund, we, we support a number of athletes. We have a number of athletes that we support in my mother's name, Jean Pickering Olympic yeah. Scholarship. Neve is one of those that we've been helping for the last three years. We've been supporting her financially, but, Part of it also is to use our contacts in the Ron Pickering Memorial Fund, be myself or other people, to support the athlete and the coach. So we've hooked Neve up with, with Goldie Sayers, who's one of our trustees. She's kind of mentoring uh, Neve. We also brought in uh, people like uh, Denise Lewis and, and things like that. But her coach, we're also trying to mentor. And, and recently in this lockdown period, you know, David's trying to reach out to other people. And I've introduced him. I took him to Holland, sat down with Charles Van Commene and, and Ronald Fetter. I've sat him down with, uh, with Frank Dick, all these people with great experience so he can learn faster. And just in the last week, um, I reached out to um, my old uh, college coach, um, Brooks Johnson, who's now 86, but one of the great hurdles coaches in the world. Uh, Harry Mara, the coach to Ashton Eaton and, and uh, um, you know, one of the great multi-events coaches in the world. And Vern Gambetta, who's kind of the father of functional training yeah. and one of the great coach leaders in the world. And I've put David in direct contact with them and he's calling them up and he can ask them whatever questions he wants because, because now we can help him accelerate his learning because yeah. he has such a special athlete that he has to grow with her and he has yeah. to up, upskill himself, and he's willing and wanting to do that. He's gone basically full-time coaching now because he understands that. So we need to support him um, to, to, to basically get the skills that he needs to support a talent like that. Yeah, and I think it's that old adage, you can never stop learning, I guess, he keeps coming into it. And, you know, Dave, like you said, and seeing what he's done is exceptional, and, and he's, you know, learning from the best, best in the world. Um, that's what happened in this Portuguese uh, situation. It's very interesting because we go to people like Mac Wilkins, who's one of the greatest throwers of all time. Mac wanted to come on and listen to what's going on. And I've made a couple of presentations and he's come back to me and said, oh, God, that was great. And what about this? And what about that? And it's the conversations that go on afterwards um, for, for, for hours, which is actually really interesting. So even, you know, Dale Stevenson and all these people, we're, we're always trying to communicate with each other all the time to see what we can pick up because... Yeah that you can always learn something. It's very important. But it's, it's like the old adage, it's when you go to a conference, all, all the, the real learning is done after the, the conference is finished over the evening meal. So yeah. um, obviously we're in, you know, unprecedented times at the moment with, with coronavirus and, and the lockdown. Um, obviously we've mentioned the, the online uh, resources and, and getting people closer together all that way. What do you think um, athletics, and, and this is going off topic maybe, is, is, you know, what do you think athletics can ultimately change coming out of this you no know, you know it, it is the season that hasn't been you know since uh, May now what, what do you think we can change about that on March sorry yeah I think there's a couple of interesting things because while I always feel it is really important for a particularly a developing athlete to have a, a coach alongside them uh, uh, most of the way and and helping uh, helping them as the athlete develops more and more they may be a, a less led by the coach but work in tandem with the coach and then sometimes also move ahead of the coach and use the coach for his skills but may look elsewhere for some other skills maybe nutrition or biomechanics and things and now that we're really talking about a global world you see it now with people with coaches all over the world that are 
where talent is moving to work with really good coaches because performance is kind of a different thing from development and yeah. looking for the right coach for you. But what it also does is open up those doorways to be able to coach remotely. So, you know, now we're in lockdown, but I'm still trying to do sessions with some of the, the girls I work with and they're setting up their phones and I'm sitting in front of the laptop. But that can work actually really well. So, yeah. you know, it's not the best, but it works. And so therefore it also means that, you know, you can have an influence over somebody in North Wales or you can yeah. bring somebody in to work with your coaches in the most remote areas. And that was going back to what my dad used to do. He said, you know, he used to pull up in his car across the side of a road and, and do a triple jump workout with coaches and, and athletes uh, along yeah. the side of a road because you just got to make do with what you've got. Yeah, so, definitely. I think that's where, you know, it's changing the face of what we will do. We can, yeah, nobody, I think if it's, nobody's out of the way, you know. You can yeah, and it, it, having that excuse, so I am, you know, it, it's too far to travel, it's not really there, you know what I mean, with, even with the phone, but now with, you know, like we're on here in that technology, you're, you're in Loughborough, I, I'm down in, in Cardiff, so yep. it enables to have that very quick discussion. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm coming towards your sort of, your connection, Sean, if, if you're going to give some advice to, to new young coaches, other than go and break down doors and barriers, you know, what, what would you say to them? I think two things. One, find a coach that you respect and you respect what he's doing. I, particularly for me, I'm really interested in what we call serial podium coaches, right? These guys that are producing athlete after athlete. We talk about Viestin Hafsteinsen, you know, why I respect Viestin so much because he's done it with a number of different athletes of different types and, and, and facilities. So when you see someone that produces year after year after year, Malcolm Arnold was a great example. Um, you can always learn from those people. So you don't always need to, uh, to actually go and, and, and ask them for their knowledge and, and try and take it down, although that's great and I'm sure they will, but just to shadow them, just to go around and, and, and find them. I talked to uh, uh, Catherine Stefanidis' coach and he was incredibly knowledgeable as her husband, Mitchell Cryer. And I said, you know, you, where did you get your information from? Where did you, because I, I listened to what you're saying. There's a really cutting edge things. And yet, you know, you're a pole vaulter. You made a quick transition into coaching. He said, look, I'm a sponge. He said, I just, I was very lucky. I would just go and stand in the background and I would watch people like Dan Path and I would soak up as much as I could. And he said, and I'm a really quiet character. I do not like to talk. But the fact is that I could just stand in the background and, and kind of not be noticed and pick up as much information as I could. And, and, and I was like that as well, you know, growing up with my father, but also when I was training, I went to America and I would just go and watch, um, you know, I would go to, to, to other people's trainings. I would go and watch Art Fanagas coach John Cadena and those athletes. And I'd go and watch Dan Lang work with Balash Kiss. And I just go and sit there and watch because yeah. you just learn so much. So expose yourself to good people. And yeah. at the same time, if you're getting good knowledge, you will be able to look through um, that correct lens and pick out what is good. There's a lot of information out there. There's all kinds of stuff on YouTube and things like that. Not all of it's good. So you've got to make sure that you have your prism, your perspective and, and your knowledge up to a certain level so you can pick out what is good, what is useful and what you can apply. Don't just follow what you see because yeah. you don't know what the background is that they've done before they've done that particular exercise. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I like what you're saying there in terms of, you know, the knowledge is there. You can find the knowledge, but seeing the coach, you know, coaching is more than just having that, that, that encyclopedia there. You know what I mean? It's how you, you know, you, you essentially you can be with that athlete two, three hours every single day. It's, it's about being that person that, not necessarily a friend, but you get on with them. You, you have that empathy. You have that sort of command, that confidence in each other to, to go after it. And I, and I do like that. Um, Thanks, Sean. Just leading on to, to three final questions, a bit of a fun round, okay? So you can be honest and open. Is there anything else you want to bring up before we do this? Or? Uh, no, no. I think you know, there's plenty of time to talk about more, the, yeah. more of these things, and I think bite-sized chunks is always the best way to get yeah. information across. Yeah, so. great. So um, what is, and, and I know you'll have a few, what is your, your favourite sporting moment? It doesn't have to be personal to you. It could be, it could be anything. I've been lucky enough to be around at, at a few and, and some of them I've been connected to and, and, uh, um, but I, I think from a personal point of view, um, winning the medal in, in, uh, in, um, in Kuala Lumpur was, was special, um, because of what led up to that. Um, but I think also, 
um, being in the stadium when some of my friends have, have done well, whether they are coaches or, or athletes, it's a special moment. And I've been lucky enough to be around sitting alongside a few of my friends and shared in, in their success. And, and that was nice. And so to watch, you know, people, um, other coaches and other athletes that I've seen struggle and come through. So there's been a few of those. My favorite sporting moment, though, has to be the 1991 um, four by 400 meters where the British guys beat the Americans and we okay. kind of outthought them and outplayed them. And, and so to watch that uh, four by four still brings uh, my heart beating a bit. Yeah. Great, great. Um, next one is, is, what is your middle name? My middle name is Deforge. So it's my mother's maiden name. Um, and so unfortunately, it's, uh, I'm the last in the line. My, uh, my mother's family, I was the only uh, male and, and try to keep the, the name going, but I haven't been able to, uh, uh, to settle down and, and, and have kids myself. So, but the name was, um, you know, back in the fifties was quite well known. So, uh, it dates back to the, the French Huguenots coming over in the 16th century. And I think they forge why it sounds, sounds fancy actually is French for Smithy. So, okay. or Smith, so um, but remember, it's, everyone yeah. calling you Smithy <laughs> after this. <laughs> exactly. But it's my um, mother's, it was my mother's maiden name. So it's important that, uh, for me to hold that. Oh, great, great. I'd love to hear that. Um, and the last one is, is, you know, what is a favorite quote? Is there any quote that springs to mind? Um, yeah, I had a, a, a couple of things. I, I think the, the one, the most important one from a coaching point of view is that you see further by standing on the shoulders of giants. So yeah. that's an important one that you learn from other people. Um, from a personal point of view, um, my father wrote me out, um, a poem when I was a kid, which was Rudyard Kipling's If, and uh, that one's pretty special as well. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Sean. Um, I just want to say, obviously, thank you for taking your time out, and you know, I'm sure you have it all the time. Thank you for from the athletes and the coaches and what you and, and your family before you've done done for the sport. Um, and just to say, everyone, this this watch this episode. If you have any questions for myself uh, or Sean, uh, you know, I'm sure Sean, like you said, is is happy to ask any. So. My email uh, is on and we can get you in contact uh, if you have any questions or we want to look uh, hear about set more seminars, pro seminars, seminars, or any other sort of track and field uh, discipline, please get in touch. And, and I thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Cheers, Ryan.